model maintenance is probably one of the most neglected, but also one of the most expensive elements of a data science project over the long term. Welcome to The Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. When considering the business benefits of AI and machine learning, it's easy to jump right to cost cutting. Chatbots, image recognition, and other process automations are all valid use cases for these technologies. But according to Swiss RE's SVP of PNC R&D, Jerry Gupta, it's time for data leaders to go further. On this episode of The Data Chief, Jerry offers his view on investing in revenue generating data models, frameworks for building and operationalizing these models, and why it will always be more challenging for data teams to maintain existing models versus innovative new ones. Tune in for these insights, plus an inside look at Jerry's work in AI ethics, policy, and regulation. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot, the modern analytics cloud company. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for anyone to analyze your company's data with search and AI. Business people at companies like Verizon, Hulu, Schneider Electric, Frontify, Hari, and Mercado use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. And you can learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. So Jerry, you have had such a fascinating career and of course data and data science related, but I also think the other aspect that's so fascinating about your background is innovation, using machine learning to create new products. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, Cindy, I think uh, when people uh, organizations, leaders, uh, stakeholders think about AI, ML. Uh, they're thinking about chatbots. They're thinking about image recognition. Uh, they're thinking about things that automate um, uh, the current processes, stuff like that. And and clearly, those are very valid use cases. They have a known efficacy. Uh, you know, they're narrow and routine, so we know it works. But but I encourage. Um, um, uh, data science practitioners and stakeholders to look beyond just the cost cutting things. Because if you look at the empirical evidence, what we are seeing based on research done by Professor Michael Davis at London Business School, uh, it's that complex data science initiatives, I'm not saying complex models, I'm saying complex initiatives that are revenue enhancing have shown a higher degree of success than simple objectives uh, related to cost cutting. Now, I don't mean to apply cost cutting initiatives are simple in general, and that revenue enhancing are complex in general. That's not the intent here. Uh, obviously, the, it's biased data. It could imply that there are more resources uh, that were deployed to revenue enhancing initiatives. So those projects had a high likelihood of success and and uh, you know, they succeeded because of that. But I think it's an eye-opening, uh, 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 the results are eye-opening in the sense that uh, they're counterintuitive to what we have thus far known, uh, that simple and, and, and easy initiatives uh, succeed. Whereas we have seen that when it comes to data science, uh, it's the revenue advancing complex initiatives that have a higher degree of success. Yeah, that is, so there's a couple of things to parse there. One is how is AI used if it's for revenue generation versus efficiency and cost cutting. And there's been some interesting research from uh, McKinsey's latest AI study to show um, some of those differences in use cases. But the other thing you refer to is the work that you do at the London School, educating the next generation or even the current generation of practitioners. So if you think about this, Jerry, why the difference or why do organizations focus more on one versus the other? Is it how easy it is to get to the data? Is it lack of imagination or what's going on? You know, that's that's a very uh, complex question. <clears throat> um, you know, there are there, there are sort of myths created around data scientists, and 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 so 
Um, that's one piece of it, or, or myth created around data science. But there are also sort of what we call the probit approach to data science, which is everything is evaluated against cost benefit. Uh, mm -hmm. you, 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 you balance it against complexity and value. You put it in a matrix and you, and you, you know, the typical BCG uh, matrix, right? Yes. And, and the problem with that approach to a certain extent, it's, it's not a wrong approach. I mean, I highly advocate that. Uh, the problem we see, uh, in, in a lot of cases with that approach is, uh, because a lot of the AI initiatives, a lot of the work that AI, you, you do, uh, is, is idiosyncratic, but I, but, but. By that, I mean, if it's bespoke work, it becomes really tough to estimate, right? Uh, what we do is we say something similar has been done by X, Y, and Z company, or something has been done by us in some other situations. So, you know, this seems like a simple thing to do. We'll do it. We'll use some different data. We'll use a different use case, and we'll use similar techniques to do it. It doesn't quite work that way in data science, because if you change data, you're changing everything at the end of mm -hmm. the day. Right. Yeah. And so what may seem like a trivial, easy exercise ends up, ends up becoming a little bit more difficult. So yeah, well, it all starts with uh, step one, which is right. So we have a framework um, created by Professor Dimitri Bertsamas at MIT Sloan. Uh, he calls it the data model framework. The data model framework says that in order to work through your data science projects, you need to have ex ante evidence that data exists. So data is the number one thing. Curated, good quality data in sufficient volume. That's number one. And that's 80%, 85% of the data modeling exercise. Anyways, data piece is the biggest uh, uh, effort. Modeling is 10 to 15% of the effort, which is where most people focus, but that's actually relatively smaller component. And then where most people don't really spend time thinking about is decisions and values, which is you should have a very clear idea before you start the project, what decisions you want the model to assist you with, right? It has to be narrow. It has to be focused. And that's where a lot of use cases fall by the wayside because they don't achieve that. And that what value we need to generate. If you don't have a clear idea of how you, what value is created, how you're going to measure that, then you're not able to create the narrative. You're not able to sell that and it becomes difficult. So that's at the project level, but even beyond that, at the, at the, at the, at the uh, if you abstract to a 50,000 feet level, there's a framework, it's called the idea framework. And the idea framework is simply this, which is before you, as a, as a team, before you as an organization embark on a data science project, you should know the IDEA of your organization, which is what is your institution? What's the infrastructure? What's the culture? What kind of data limitations and regulations are you operating under? If you're an insurance company or a healthcare company, you are under tremendous amount of data restriction, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of alternatives exist, right? Expl exploration, what kind of exploration you can do? What similar, what similar models exist because that gives you, helps you calibrate the effort. And, and so you're, which answers your first question, which is you're able to better estimate the effort and then accountability and auditability, right? How, what kind of mechanisms exist to make that model trustable? So I love mnemonics to remember these things. IDEA, -E idea. <laughs> I like that. Um, but you, you kind of broke down three things, the data, the model, the value. And I, I would say we should be starting with the value. So if you take us through either work you're doing at, at Swiss Re now or work that you've done at Amazon in the past, for example, take us through the potential value. So is it in improving the underwriting or the risk of reinsurance? Take us through that. So it starts with discovery of pain point, right? So the quality of your output depends on, upon the quality of your input. So the planning is the single most important thing. How you create your use case is the most important thing there, right? And the use case has, when you consume use cases, they could be around uh, underwriting, writing uh, uh, better underwriting models. They could be around 
um, better customer acquisition. It could be around customer retention. So over the last 15 years, uh, uh, some of the more successful models I've built have been around customer retention, where we can use analytics to predict which customers are at risk of attrition, and then you can create interventions to increase the probability of them staying with you. Better acquisition, where we can target customers in a manner where the probability of them binding with you increases. And then obviously underwriting is a big piece of what you do. So customer retention, clear that this would be revenue generating. And you talk about going to the business, understanding the use case. And yet, given that you also are a professor in this field, we are finding that data scientists are coming into the field without good business domain expertise, storytelling, communication expertise. So how do you marry these two? Is it the business understanding more what is possible with machine learning and AI and what's not? Or is it upskilling the communication skills or bringing in facilitators to do design thinking to blend these two range of experts? Maybe it's the left brain and right brain, actually, that you talk about a lot. Yeah, so, you know, you're exactly right, Cindy. There is a tremendous shortfall of data scientists in the industry, in the market right now, right? Uh, some estimates range from 200,000 uh, per year to higher, right? And um, this shortfall or this talent gap has existed for the last five or six years. And expectation was around this time, 2022, 2023, we would be starting to bridge the gap because it's been, uh, well, not just five, six years, almost, almost been a decade. And, and typically it takes about a decade for talent to catch up to, uh, supply to catch up to demand when it comes to talent. What we are seeing, however, is that the talent gap is actually widening. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so it is disheartening to see that, obviously, but that's happening. And so what we are doing as an industry uh, uh, is we are sort of creating hybrid data scientists. What I mean by that? So if you look at a typical data scientist, the definition of a data scientist by Professor Tom Davenport of uh, Babson is uh, a, a, a data scientist is a technical person, so should know languages, uh, programming languages, should know statistics, and should know business, right? Uh, you know, should we'll know business. Some, should should know, know business. business. But I would right. say many of the newer ones do not. Majority do you agree? Them, Disagree? Right? I, no, I totally agree with you, right? Yeah. So if you look at LinkedIn, look at job descriptions for data scientists, if you go and, and do a search of job description for data scientists, what you will see is 90% of the job descriptions, and that's, I, that's a made-up number, it's probably higher than that, are overweight on the technical aspects. Yeah. So they will say we want a PhD, they will say we want Java, Django, this, this, this. Um, and they will sort of discount the business expertise. Research has shown, however, that in the early stages, business savvy journalists trump tech specialists, right? So if you have a data science team, uh, composed of business-focused generalists who do know some statistics, who know some programming, they will outperform a team which is made entirely of tech specialists, right? So, you know, the, the, the class we teach at MIT, we, we say, what, what are the three things, what are, you know, from a, a mathematical, statistical point of view, what are the key things you should know? Oh, you should know linear al algebra, which is not complicated. You should hopefully know linear optimization, which is a function of linear algebra to a certain extent. You should know some calculus, not, not complex, simple calculus. And you should know probability, right? Those are not the things that you need a PhD for, right? So, so we, what we are trying to do is we are trying to demystify data science so it doesn't be, uh, become the exclusive domain of the left brain, where yeah. you are able to marry the intuition with the technology in order to make it more accessible to uh, the general population, really. Okay. So um, the business value, business <clears throat> outcomes, we, we've got to marry these two sides or professions together. 
And then you said it, well, it's the machine learning on top of the data. And you did say clean data. And I want to um, quote a statistic from research from McKinsey AI High Performers. And the degree that organizations actually have a process in place to assess the quality of the data is less than half. And that's also between the high performers in AI and uh, the average performers as, as they call them. So if we're building models on top of poor quality data, why are we doing that? There are two reasons for that, right? So uh, I, I, I agree with McKelsey's assessment. Uh, garbage in garbage in is garbage out, right? So that that that's proven. Data is the most important thing. But there's some nuance to this. Um, there, there's a theory called the unreasonableness of data, and that was that's been uh, published by Microsoft, which was if you have two models, one complex, one simple. So let's say one regression model, one neural network model. To the neural network. Well, let's say, well, neural net for you can't really use for a thin data, but let's say one is XGBoost and one is regression. To XGBoost, you you feed data, but not too much data. But to the regression model, you feed tons of more data. Mm -hmm. The simpler model will always outperform the more complex model, right? So I think to a certain extent, <coughs> the data does correct for itself. So regression towards mean is the concept there, right? If you have enough data, chances are the data will correct itself, right? Now, it doesn't solve for standardization, it doesn't, but it, it will solve for normalization and things of that nature, right? If, if the data, if the data values themselves are incorrect, if you have a huge number of data, each of them calibrated incorrectly, it doesn't solve that problem. But if there are some idiosyncrasies within data, as you get more value of data, it'll regress towards mean. Uh, you know, uh, you, you you will start getting good results. So, you know, but I think the 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 your question is more specific in terms of how I, I, how are organizations dealing with data. So even though we have a proliferation of data, we are collecting more data than ever before in history. The quality of that data is still suspect, and we saw that in the case of yeah. COVID, right, where uh, you know there was biased data and all of those things, right. So. So when, when I launch projects and when I look at data, the first thing I ask is, what's the prominence of the data, right? Which is who collected it, in, in, in which situations, using which processes? Because that dictates to you how relevant the data is. And I'm not making a judgment on the good or badness of the data. I'm making a judgment on the relevancy of the data for your project, right? So for example, I'll take a very practical example. In the early stages of the pandemic, we were getting data mostly from nursing homes, right? It was good we were getting some data, we were able to build some models, but we were severely overestimating the mortality rate, right? Because there was biased data. Now for specific situations, that data was good enough, it allowed us to embark on the first step. The first step is the most important step in data science. So we also, um, you know, we also teach that don't wait for perfect data. As right. long as you have line of sight, into more data, take the first step. Yeah, or no, just knowing how the data is biased or what data gaps you have. So you referred to the data set being skewed heavily towards nursing home data. So people overestimated the mortality rate. Maybe I should ask, do you think that people interpreting the results of the model understood this um, bias in the data set. You know, so we worked with MIT on this again with Professor Dmitry Butzmas, who's one of the leaders in, and he built some of the most uh, uh, most uh, highly efficacious models around uh, interventions and stuff. And and I remember speaking with him in May, June, July of 2020, and I think there was there was an understanding that the data is biased. Yeah. Right. Um, but I think, you know, data science is a very nuanced subject. Mm -hmm. When you 
publish something, you can publish 20 caveats, say this, 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 and this, but it's the, it's the summary headline that gets picked up by, by stakeholders. And I think that's what really happened. Those of us who were doing the analysis knew fairly early on what the limitations were data on, uh, of, of data were. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's assume then <laughs> we have good clean data, we have good business value or the desired outcome that we want to achieve. It's uh, customer retention. So now we build the model. And yet so often these models never become operationalized. So a more recent study from Katie Nuggets estimated less than 20%. There's an article from Tom Davenport in Harvard Data Science Review estimating 14%. What, what's going on? Why are we not operationalizing more of these models? Yeah, so, so I think 14% deployability is, I think, the more accurate number as opposed to 20%. So. Um, and even that doesn't capture the the, uh, the initiatives that get abandoned at an earlier stage. So the, the real number of beginning of the journey to the end of the journey is probably even even worse. Uh, <clears throat> so Cindy, we talked about the idea framework. We talked about uh, you know the data models, decisions, values framework, right? Uh, you know uh, the there are two broad buckets. If, if, if you look at the failure modes, right? So why do 85% of projects fail? 80% well, of the time, or, or more precisely, 82% of the time, they fail because of three reasons. One is the people who are building or, or running those projects are not, lack of right talent. That's 36% of the time, that's the case, right? Another 30% of the time, the reason is that it is not aligned to the right use case. There's no real path to ROI. And again, another 16% of the time, the reason is uh, lack of stakeholder alignment, engagement, uh, uh, miscommunication, things of that nature, right? So that's why the idea framework combined with the DMDV framework is super powerful because what it does is, it, in data science, it, you have to start with a narrow and routine task. What happens in most businesses is when they build a use case, invariably the use case is too broad. What I do now is I start, I start with a use case and the use case needs to have four elements. I call it the pause, P-A-W-S, which is, needs to have a pain point. It needs to have all the actors who are involved. So everybody who is impacted by that. The proposed workflow and, and how it will look like in the end state because that gives us an idea of the data ins and outs, which systems are impacted, so on and so forth. And most importantly, simplicity. It should be in simple English, no more than one slide, right? It has to start with that. We consume that, and then we build issue tree after that. And we, so we'll take the use case and we'll build an issue tree, and we invariably realize that the use case has, is actually not just one project, it's, it's probably three or four or five projects. So once we break it down into those individual projects, then we will deploy the DMDV model framework. Data more decisions values, which is data. Where is it coming from? Who, what, who, what, when, where, why? Models, who, where, when, what, why? Decisions, who, when, where, what, why? Values, what do we hope to get out of it? So you have to answer the five W's and the H for each of the DMDV elements. So you know exactly what's happening. There's no room for ambiguity. That being said, you cannot make data science too process driven because you need to have feedback loops throughout the process because the business changes, their vision might, their not vision, their object, the business objectives might change midstream. You need to account for that. Yeah, so I love all the frameworks that you give to help people remember these things, Jerry. Um, pause, I like that one. I do think the, the statistic you cited about 85% of machine lear learning projects fail. I did debate this with Ben Taylor, the chief data scientist and evangelist at um, Data Robot. And in my view, it's if there was experimentation 
and you're learning what doesn't work, that's okay. So uh, when I say fail, is it is it fails to deliver ROI or if you learned um, and experimented and identified the biases, that's okay. But if it's a lot of models that just never see the light of day and there was not a learning, to me, that is the failure then. Fair enough, Sydney. I totally agree with that. Yeah, but and yet... <laughs> I think the 85% failure rate is more around lack of uh, deployability and lack of ROI, I think. Lack, yeah, lack of ROI. And then, um, and yet, let's say that machine learning model does get into production. This is where debating this with another leader in this space, the chief algorithms officer at Stitch Fix, um, before that at Netflix, he says, what I like about this versus say general analytics and BI is that the attribution to improvement is so clear. You deploy the model, you retain those customers, and you can very articulate what has the lift been from that model. So that's when, that's what good looks like. I don't know. Do you agree, or how do we how do we get more of this very clear value statements? So again, everything is nuance in data science, right? So in in data science, in any model, it's it's a matter of finding the right balance. The first balance you have to find, which I believe in my mind, the most critical balance is between interpretability and accuracy, right? Which is are you going to prioritize accuracy or are you going to prioritize interpretability? I almost always uh, prioritize interpretability, which means if I have a regression model that's performing at 85% AUC versus I have a XG boost performing at 90% AUC, uh, I would most likely pick uh, the regression model uh, provided it, it, it exceeds the acceptability, acceptability threshold. Yeah, That's what it, is. what is the use case if it's life and death versus yeah. insure them, retain them, it's different. Yeah. Yes. So now coming to life and death, which was going to be my second point. The second is second one is between accuracy and 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 uh, so precision and recall fairly, right? Accuracy, false positive, uh, uh false negative. In a lot of situations, especially in healthcare. You want to minimize false negatives, even if you sacrifice accuracy, right? So if you chase accuracy, you might actually uh, be not doing a very good job, right? Then there is a balance between uh, accuracy and generalizability, which means do you build such a complex model that goes out of back every three months, even though it's highly accurate, or do you build a slightly simpler, slightly less accurate model that stays uh, relevant without maintenance for the next one year, right? So those are the different kind of balances that you have to find uh, uh, when you when you build a model. For me, uh, accuracy is not the most important thing, and and so I don't always look for lift. Having a lift is important if you're building upon an existing model. But for me, it's about am I because listen. <clears throat> I hate to uh, break this to people uh, because most of them don't really understand it, but uh, or realize it that the cost of building the model, if you if you read uh, the MIT Sloan Tech Review, is one hundredth the cost of what the lifetime cost of the model. Okay, so if you're building a complex model, you know the maintenance cost of a model is about thirty to forty percent of the original cost of building it. So if you're building a complex model, even if it's accurate, your ongoing costs are so high that it put pressure on your ROI, it puts pressure on your team, it puts pressure on your infrastructure. So I think, Cindy, you have to find the right balance where when you build a model, you look at accuracy for sure, but you also look at other metrics, which is to say, how often is it going out of whack? And you yeah. know the more complex it is, the more often it's going to go out of whack. Thank you for taking us through that nuance. And I think that's the other thing is that models, it, so it's not just getting it into production, it's looking for drift and re-optimizing. And 67% of organizations, according to the McKinsey survey, have said that they're not 
actively monitoring for drift. So um, is this again, we're, we're just not getting the right stakeholders aligned or it's too difficult. It's operationalize it, but then we don't go back in tune and watch these things. It's, it's a whole lot of things. It's, it's, it's about people process technology, right? Which is uh, people, which, which is uh, we don't have the data science teams who, you know, for every five models that are deployed, you are basically fully allocating a data science domain, right? And, and so when a choice comes for an organization, the choice that they face is, do we deploy our expensive talent and maintaining a model, or do we deploy them in building new models? That's one. And, and unfortunately, uh, that's, uh, you know, they, they almost always decide to uh, uh, put them in, in building new models. The new, uh, and, yes, and it's, not that, it's more fun. <laughs> right, well, it's more fun, but it also, and the second piece of it is the people piece, which is, uh, you know, uh, data scientists are, uh, you know, we are excited by building new things, by moving the needle. And so if you ask me, Cindy, if you were a manager and you said, hey, Jerry, stop building new models, those five models you've built, just just keep maintaining them. Chances are within the next two or three weeks, you're going to see my resignation, right? Yeah. So I, I think I think there is that dichotomy. There's this is very delicate balance uh, that we see in the market where, you know, you are forced to start keep building new things in order to keep people motivated, to keep your stakeholders happy, to keep your data scientists happy, and what gets relegated is the deployed models. The second piece is uh, modern maintenance is, is, is a non-trivial function, um, especially if you don't have the modern server, serverless architecture deployed because you may, in some situations we have seen where companies have had to bring down their operational model in order to update it, right? If you're working in, in the more modern tech environment, you don't have to do it, you know, dev versus ops and all of those things. So that's, so infrastructure also becomes a constraint. Um, so, you know, I think there are multiple reasons for that, but you're exactly right. Uh, model maintenance is probably one of uh, the most uh, neglected, but also the most ex one of the most expensive elements of a data science project over the long term. And that's one of the areas that we within Swiss Re are trying to address as well. Right. So we do like new things. If you look across your decades in this space and across all the organizations you've worked with, is there one use case that you look back on and say, that was really fun, that was really cool and impactful? You know, <clears throat> early on in my career, uh, Cindy, um, I, I built a model to uh, uh, predict customer attrition and <clears throat> and and sort of uh, uh, create interventions um, on on how to sort of prevent those customers from leaving. And and I think that that was a really interesting project for me because it was simple logistics regression. Well, it was GLM actually. It was simple regression model. So here you have lot of data, you're using one of the most simple techniques available to data scientists to create a model that has an outsized impact on your organization, right? So, you know, from a, from a pure ease of use, ease of deployment and that value extracted for the few, that was, what, that was such a great project. I, I really loved it. The other one is a more recent project where we built a, a credit default prediction model. And in that model, <clears throat> you know, one would imagine that, you know, it's, it's a solved problem. There are enough, uh, you know, credit ratings and this and that out there that uh, you don't really have to do anything. But, you know, we were able to build a model uh, that performs much better than anything that exists right now. Uh, and, 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 and it was a mixture of really innovative feature engineering and, and a really innovative interpretable model that we built. So, so those, those are, those are top of mind. I mean, again, over the course of my career, I built NLP models and all of those things, but those are, I would say more, um, sort of, uh, 
cool models as opposed to the models where the 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 effort to value um, multiple was, was super great. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I wasn't sure what you would pick, um, but doing research on your work, I I was th- looking at um, the role you had in launching Amazon Prime Video in India. And maybe that's because I was also picturing people streaming content when this was still a novel idea and looking at things like the bandwidth, um, the speed of the network and the likelihood to subscribe um, is, was, so is that just an everyday thing now for you or does that also stand out in your portfolio? Yeah, so so bandwidth dependent streaming was actually a startup, and that was not part of the Amazon. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, so I, I so we did that for a for a digital streaming startup that I was associated with, where the quality of the of of the streaming, the codecs and everything, it, it's a little bit more complicated than saying you know uh, the streaming uh, the bandwidth is this, so so use this. Uh, the way you encrypt, the way you uh, do it is a little bit different. Uh, that was a, uh, a, 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 I would say that, that had less to do with data science because the discovery and solution were not like, you know, Cindy has four bandwidth just because you, you have the data. It, it was more around the different encryption standards and, and, uh, and how, uh, the team that I was working with was able to use really innovative techniques at that time to, uh, uh, to sort of uh, zip up, the, for lack of a better word, zip up the files in a manner that allowed high quality content to be deployed uh, in, in low bandwidth situations. Yeah. And so, again, I think it just shows, Jerry, the range of domains that you know. You also um, work or advise some innovation around blockchain. Do you want to share anything about that? So, uh, so the same team uh, that I was working with for the digital streaming uh, startup, uh, they have the MyCryptons, is the name of the company, and and it's really simple. It's it's really a fun play, where uh, where people can take their pictures or caricatures of themselves, and then they can create NFTs and cryptons and basically NFTs out of them. So this is an idea we came up with five or six years ago. It was basically uh, uh, Srinivasan is 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 my is my uh, is is the person who's really the founder of this, a uh, brilliant guy out of California, and and so this was really a fun thing. You know, we were trying to say, well, this is five years ago, six years ago, before NFTs even existed, and it's like, how can we make this fun? How can we get people engaged in all of those things, and and how can we use blockchain? Uh, frankly, blockchain was not the critical factor. We could have used any technology ah, for okay. that, but it just helps blockchain. Blockchain helped us because the 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 cryptons you create, which is really NFTs, they are immutable and they have a permanent record and all of those things. Right. So I do think Jerry that everyone listening on the Data Chief podcast, um, hopefully they know by now what an NFT is, <laughs> but maybe just to be sure, do you want to elaborate? I mean. I'm still kind of chuckling about is this does this have legs? Will this remain real? But why don't you define it for us? Yeah, so you know, here's how I would say this, right? We are, you know, if you if you look at the London, uh, sorry, New York Stock Exchange, right? It started under a tree. Was it real then? I look at where where it's now. Is it real now? Right. So I think okay. NFTs <laughs> are a little bit little bit on the same space, and and. I think it has less. I think there's real value in it, uh, but I think it needs people who are credible, who are trustworthy, and 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 who are able to accurately match demand and supply to do it. So what, what's happening? What what, was, what what really is NFT? Right? I, I'm sure 99 percent of your viewers know what it is, but 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 an NFT simply is a mechanism where you're you're taking any artifact, be it a picture, a painting, anything really. It could be anything. Uh, any artifact, and you're creating different manifestations of that, and at each of that manifestation is unique, and that individual manifestation is sold to a buyer, 
who will become the sole owner of that particular manifestation. So, you know, I'm here sitting right now, and let's say if I was to NFT my picture here, uh, I, I, I'm wearing the black headphone, white and blue shirt, uh, black glasses. So if, if, if the data chief says, you know, we're going to NFT out or create NFTs out of all our, our guest speakers. So you would take a picture of me like this on this podcast and you would use multiple mechanisms. You'll take the different attributes around me and you can create multiple variations like permutations and combinations. In one, you would have gray glasses, red shirt, different permutations, and each one of them becomes unique where no representation is duplicated. And for those who are interested, uh, they would buy it, they would keep it. It has a lot of value in, in, in art. I think it has significant value in art. It has significant value in underappreciated art. So I'm not talking about the Mona Lisa's of the world and the others of the world. I'm talking about, uh, you know, rural artisans. I'm talking about indigenous cultures. I'm talking about art that is at the risk of being forgotten, where... Uh, and, and we're talking about uh, artists, uh, you know, musicians and others who, who, who don't have a chance of winning a Grammy because they don't have the follower and the backing and stuff, yeah. but they can really monetize their art uh, using NFTs. The problem with NFTs uh, that existed in November, since then they've crashed by and large, the demand has dried up. The problem with NFTs is it became a snake oil salesman coffee environment. But if you had the channel, if you had someone who was a good speaker, talker, who could talk for eight hours a day on, on, online, uh, it became a marketing play as opposed to a true asset play or a true value play. But I think this, this current downturn is good because the cream is going to rise to the top. We'll have people with real ideas, with real values, bringing real buyers and sellers together as opposed to uh, I'll be gone, you'll be gone kind of. Uh, buyers and sellers uh, who are simply looking to churn things. Yeah, well, for sure. I like the idea of the, let's say, the long tail of artists that we don't discover today. I like the idea of our data chief guests as an NFT, <laughs> but I think you're going to have to build a predictive model for our CMO to see if that one would actually pay off. Um, if people would buy that, but I, I think those are... I will take you up on that offer. Ah, I think that's an interesting okay. idea. I think it's an interesting idea you, too. You, you can talk about data and I will invariably be in, I will always be interested. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Let's see if we can make that happen. That would be so fun. Um, you know, Jerry, so you you do innovative things, you work on tough societal problems, big business problems at Swiss Re. You also are at the forefront of informing policymakers on regulation of AI um, and machine learning. So what is your thinking here? Do we need more of it, less of it? How does it impact all this innovation? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, um... I've collaborated with different stakeholders, including universities and, and, and businesses in drafting guidelines and so on and so forth. Some of the papers are on my LinkedIn profile for those of you who want to uh, take a look at them. But, you know, when I look at data science, you know, um, any model you build, you have to look at it uh, through two lenses. One is the lens of the data quality. The other one is human impact, right? And, and, and the way, um, and again, this is not my framework. Again, it's London Business School uh, framework. Uh, the way I look at it is if the data quality is bad, um, you know, you, your model is always suspect. You're always at risk. If the, if the data quality is good and the human impact is low, then again, it's safe. But if the human impact is medium to high, then you should always be a little bit careful, right? Um, you know, the ethics of data science uh, need to be um, sort of ruled out at different levels, right? At the regulatory level, at the company level, at the person level, right? I mean, so one of the things that I'm a big propon proponent of is a code of ethics for data scientists, right? Yeah. We, we just don't have that, you know. Um, you know, doctors make decisions that impact humans, lawyers do. They both have code of ethics. 
data scientists are affecting lives of humans, especially if you're writing an underwriting model or recruitment model or stuff like that. But we are not held accountable, right? So there needs to be some amount of accountability, a code of ethics. Uh, I proposed a mechanism, I called it the NEAT mechanism, where you have to agree to build algorithms that are NEAT, which means they're neutral, explainable, accountable, and trustable. And there's a whole framework underneath that. Um, also, you know, there has to be a regulatory framework. I think by and large, GDPR is really good. CCPA is fairly good. And, and those things are going to get strengthened even more. But I think no matter how much regulations you build, unless there's accountability and, and an ethics, uh, et ethical culture in the organization and within the individual, uh, there's nothing you could do, right? Uh, it shouldn't be difficult, right? If all of us agree that we will subscribe to a code of ethics, now again, uh, you know, I'm part of the IRGC out of EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland, and one of the questions there was, Yes, it's easy to develop a code of ethics, but whose ethics? Yeah, the cultural and nuances, how do you right? enforce so, it? How do, how do you enforce it if it if it's yeah. an individual, but within a company that um, has a different set of ethics? Then it's difficult. Um, I I Please do roll, like the exactly. idea though of mm -hmm. at least raising the awareness, a kind of Hippocratic oath for data science professionals. Exactly. I mm -hmm. think that in your neat mnemonic, so another mnemonic, the E for explainability, I ran a poll on LinkedIn earlier this year asking what people thought, what lever would have the best impact to minimize biases of AI. And 35% said explainability. I didn't give education as an option, but we kind of collectively debating this afterwards. We thought education is really the root of all of this. But explainability, some organizations push back on because they don't want to give out their IP. Um, is this an excuse or what are your thoughts? <clears throat> I mean, I, I would, I, I would, I wouldn't say it's an excuse. I think there are legitimate concerns about proprietary black box algorithms, and 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 keeping them um, shielded. Um, but I think there are mechanisms where you could have explainability. Well, maybe not explainability, but at least some degree of so in, interpret interpretability is is knowing what's affecting the outcome. Extra explainability is a little bit more deeper, which tells you the why is why this is happening. So explainability is not always achievable uh, unless you open up the model. Uh, it's not always possible. Sometimes it's possible, but interpretability by and large can be achieved even in a black box model. So uh, you know, I, I think, uh, um, and then bias detection. Uh, you, you know, if you take interpretability and add bias de detection on top of that, uh, it doesn't require any disclosures that are proprietary. It doesn't require you to open up the black box. That are still achievable. They should be mandatory, especially, especially, especially for models that are impacting human beings. They should be, they should be uh, not just for, uh, for uh, high value models like the underwriting models, or the healthcare models where the impact is immediate, but they should also be there for models that show us, decide which content to show us. Yeah. Because that uh, those are insidious models that have long-term impact. Yeah, that we don't even realize. Well, Jerry, you've given us so many mnemonics. We'll put these in the show notes, idea, pause, neat. I, I like these mnemonics, it helps people remember. Um, let's uh, switch to some lightning rounds. When you're not doing data science, data and analytics, what do you do in your free time for fun? Free time for fun. I like to uh, run. It doesn't look like I do, but I do. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Uh, so running movies. the city uh, streets of Boston or do you go along the waterfront? Uh, along the waterfront. So I live close to the, so I live in a uh, in, in neighborhood, <coughs> excuse me, just not that far from the water. 
that I love to cook. So uh, if, 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 if I have one fashion, I think I would say it's cooking. Cooking. Okay. Any particular dishes? Um, I, I tend to, so, so I'm, I'm Indian by background. So I love making Indian food because I feel like it's tough to get uh, attending Indian food at restaurants. So I try to replicate as much of my mother's recipes as, as possible, but then I do experiment as well. I'll add some, you know, different touches to it. Um, but yeah, but I, 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 you know, I love Chinese. So I, I, I do cook a whole lot of Chinese food as well. And, and, and. And I think I'm better than most restaurants at this no, point. No, there so you go. I, I do experiment <laughs> with different cuisines. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to share a recipe that I just discovered um, from uh, an author from India and a restaurant in New York that we just discovered that had really good Indian. But I'll share that offline with you. Well, Jerry, I always Perfect. like to end with one of two questions, and you can decide which one you're in the mood for today. Either something in the last year that has made you just laugh out loud, because we could all do with a little more humor and joy in our lives, or in this moment, what are you most grateful for? You know, I, I would answer the second question. Uh, I just got over COVID and I'm really grateful that, you know, it didn't impact me more than it did because, um, you know, two years later, uh, I thought we are at the other side of it. And, and then, then this thing happens. It's, it's sort of demoralizing. It, it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, everything that you can think of, especially when it's not mild, uh, but the fact that it's over, the fact that now I have natural immunity, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm really grateful for that. But I'm also grateful for the fact that despite everything that's happened over the last two years and what still continues to happen, uh, you know, in certain parts of the world, that, you know, we are still, at least in this country, still resilient, right? You know, uh, yes, things are not as great as they can be, but, uh, you know, we're still not seeing uh, any significant levels of panic or anything in businesses, which is super surprising. I remember early 2000s when at the slightest hint of market volatility, uh, companies would start laying off and stuff like that. And, and so I'm super glad that uh, companies are more resilient. They are more aware of, 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 of human capital and things of that nature. So I'm grateful for a lot of things. Well, I'm so glad you're okay now, Jerry. Sorry to hear you've gone through that, as have many of our listeners, even for the first time now, two years into the pandemic. Um, but resilience, what a beautiful thought. Um, yes, grateful for resilience. Thank you, Jerry, for being on The Data Chief. Thank you, Cindy. It was a pleasure uh, being here, and thank you so much for having me.